And again, any information that I present today um, should not be used in the place of proper medical, nutritional, or biomedical support. Please contact your health care provider if you do want to consider any type of uh, biomedical interventions. Oops, oh dear. And as Karen already said, these are my credentials, and although these are my credentials on paper, I feel like my, my claim to fame, my greatest achievement in life is that I have a child who is diagnosed with autism who is recovering and is making substantial grain, gains and I feel like is going to be a contributing member to society. Uh, one thing I would like to mention, I had both uh, the great honor to uh, contribute to Understanding Autism for Dummies, a phenomenal book that was uh, put out by Stephen Shore. I was able to contribute to three chapters in this book. It's a wonderful resource of biomedical and behavioral information. It provides a breakdown of both sides, so if you're not familiar, familiar with biomedical, it gives a kind of like a simplistic approach to biomedical approaches, and if you're not familiar with behavioral, it does the same thing for that. I used it while I was on the airplane, reading it to refresh my memory, because I don't do this as a full-time job. I, I work in a, or science research, and it's a tremendous, tremendous resource of information, and it's explained in a way that's that anybody can understand, but it, it's not like, it, it doesn't dummy it down. It, it presents it in a way that is uh, reasonable and realistic, and it's not too sciencey, and it's not not too sciencey. I, I think it's a tremendous resource of information. Now, obviously, you wouldn't be at this conference if you didn't know what autism is. But, um, I, love, I love this picture that was done by an artist called John Fopel. Uh, the quote that goes under this is, 23,376 days of solitary confinement and still counting. And in many cases, that's, that's how autistic people feel. They're trapped inside a body, they understand what's going on around them, and yet they, they can't communicate their feelings, their wants, their needs to anybody. And it affects normal brain functioning. And I like to show this picture too, because it's, it's one of the telltale signs for normal neurotypical development, that, standi that standard pointing. When you see a normal neurotypically developing baby, they're going to point for something if they can't talk. And if your child is not doing that, that's one of the red flags. And sometimes autism, autism is like a time bomb. You go through 12 to 18 months of normal development, and then all of a sudden there's a loss of language, a loss of communication, a loss of developed skills. And the other thing that's tricky about autism is that it affects children in a spectrum of ways. No two, child, no two children are affected the same way. And the really, really tough part about autism is that, unfortunately, there is no definitive cure. You're not going to go to a physician and they're not going to tell you that this will definitely, definitely work because what works for one child doesn't necessarily work for another. And this goes for biomedical and behavioral. Sometimes these, these have to be tailored to your family's needs. You know, some people are very, very anal and like everything organized, and some people like their stuff all over the place. And that applies to, to, to therapy treatments, too. <clears throat> However, autism is treatable. Uh, there's recent medical research that shows that autism is treatable and that early intervention leads to the best outcomes. That means if you suspect that your child might have autism, the sooner that you get them to go in and get evaluated, the, the more likely successful outcomes will entail. Uh, so you go to your uh, primary health care provider and you do an initial uh, evaluation. Is that on there? Anyway, um, and get an idea of your child is developing normally. And again, these are the first signs of abnormal development, sp particularly no smiling, uh, no, no back and forth, like you, they'll hand you a cookie and you'll hand it back, uh, no babbling, that's one of the key, key signs. And again, you all should be familiar with this if you're, if you're at this conference. 
and absolutely if they don't have any words, any expressive language, but as, particularly if they're silent, if they're really, really quiet. That's one of the noticeable. Quiet, not talking, not smiling, smiling, not responding to their name. And I like to show this picture because, um, not that I know that this child is autistic, but it's kind of got, if, if you have an autistic child, you recognize this kind of blank stare. Again, it's not necessarily a telltale sign, but I, I would be wary if you took photograph after photograph and you start looking at your pictures and you see this kind of blank stared look. Uh, the checklist for autism toddlers is chat, and it's a screening tool that can be used by your developmental uh, pediatrician to evaluate. And a lot of this information is also in your handout, too, so I don't want to read it all. And like I said, I have a lot to cover. But the five key chat items is pretend play, um, demanding something like I want that or that or that, following a point, doing real pretend play, not just lining up your toys, and uh, pointing. If your child fails all five key items, they have a high risk for developing autism. So if you go in and get an evaluation, it will help you not be in denial, maybe, uh, make appropriate decisions as to how you want to proceed with your child. And even when you go in and get an evaluation, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to do anything about it. When my child was evaluated, I'm like, no, that can't be. That's not my child. I don't believe that. So part of the whole healing process is actually accepting also that there is something with your child. And if you can't even get to that point, you can't make decisions to do anything. And as a parent, that's one of the hardest steps to take, to actually admit there's something wrong with my child, and then I better do something about it. Uh, there, there are also uh, specific testing tools, and these are just a, a list of several of the tools that are available that you can use to evaluate your child. I'm not saying one is best of the other, but just to educate yourself. I like parents to know all the information that's out there. If you don't educate yourself, uh, you cannot implement anything. You need to be able to be aware of the different things that are out there so you can make the best choices for your child. Remember, ultimately, it's your responsibility. Your child is your responsibility. If you don't educate yourself, how are you going to know to make any choices? And as I said, it helps you make the best choices for your child and your family. So there's basically three treatment approach areas for autism that you can consider. Behavioral educational, um, sensory issues, and health problems. So I'm going to cover the behavioral educational interventions first. Um, they cover uh, educational type programs and sensory integration. Oh, I'm, I'm just breaking it out that the sensory integration covers speech, occupational, physical therapy, and auditory interventions. And as I mentioned earlier, no one treatment works for every child. What works for one might not work for another. But success may often include the combination of several treatments. Like you might want to use one kind of behavioral approach and then maybe use a, one type of sensory integration approach and then maybe work your way into one kind of biomedical approach. And one thing I also mentioned to parents is go slowly. Don't jump into everything that you hear this weekend all at once. Pick something that you think suits yourself and your family. Work with that for a little while, then introduce something else. Keep a diary on your kitchen counter even for behavioral, for biomedical, for sensory, for whatever. Because all of a sudden, things kind of like insidiously creep up on you. Uh, for example, my, my child, I, we were so, so fortunate. We got Fast Forward, which is a reading program, um, implemented in her public school program. And all of a sudden, she started having um, she started having a boom of language, and I'm, you know, I'm a biomedical background. I'm like, well, gee, I haven't changed anything in her diet, and I haven't given her any biomedical changes. And I went in and talked to some of the therapists at school, and they're like, oh, yeah. After they finish the program, about three to four weeks afterwards, they start to have a boom of language. You know, and it's so hard when you're in your day-to-day -day life to keep track of what's going on. If you just keep like a little, go to the dollar store and buy a little spiral-bound notebook, keep it on the kitchen counter, and just shut down. She said this today, or he said that today, or, you know, he, he went and took something out of the cabinet and brought it to me, or, you know, quit flapping, quit stump, stimming, just, just to remind yourself as the weeks progress what's going on.